I want to wish you all, or maybe I should ask you to wish me a happy 4th of July. Today, of course, is the day where we declared independence over the evil tyrant King George VIII, which reminds me of the story about uh, the American who was visiting London and he was talking to his English friend and he says, you know, we fought a revolution against your government because it was, it was wrong to have taxation without representation. And the English fellow says, so how do you like it with representation? <laughs> It turns out it's not, not much better with representation than it was uh, without. Uh, so good morning, thank you. This is my third time to uh, Israel for this program. One of these days I need to see more than just Neve Elan, but uh, so most of the time I've been here and maybe the old city for a half a day. Uh, so uh, thanks for, uh, for coming. I'm gonna talk about the Economic Freedom of the World Project. Russ Roberts is uh, talk last night was a, a really good introduction. It sort of sets the stage for me to talk about my work. Uh, I'm going to more or less do what Russ did last night, but I'm going to do it with numbers. I'm a numbers guy. As you might have picked up, Russ Roberts is not really a numbers guy. He's, a, he's into the theory and the philosophy of economic freedom. I don't have much patience for that. Uh, it, it's hard to talk about these things without talking about the philosophy and the theory. But at the end of the day, many of the uh, questions, and in fact, if you listen to Russ's answers, many of his answers were empirical answers. They were answers related to, well, I think this is what happens. And if you have economic freedom, or this is what happens if you don't have economic freedom. So uh, I'm the empirical guy who's gonna try to put some some information together about, about that. But I want to talk a little bit before I get into the numbers about that philosophy and about why I began, when I was about your age, I began working on this economic freedom of the world project when I was 21 years old. And uh, I, was gra I was a graduate student and my professor came to me and says, we're gonna do an economic freedom index. I'm like, what is that? I've never heard of such a thing. He says, we're going to collect a bunch of data, and we're going to score countries on how economically free they are. And the reason uh, my professor and the people that he was working with at the Fraser Institute, the reason that they wanted to create an index of economic freedom, a number, a measurement, was because there was a lot of confusion and debate, even among people that liked economic freedom about what it meant and whether it was getting better here or getting worse there or whatever. So we wanted to create a measurement. But we've been arguing uh, about economic freedom for a very long time. Now, we didn't always use that term, economic freedom. You may use other terms like laissez-faire or um, free enterprise, free markets. Uh, Adam Smith's term in The Wealth of Nations was a system of natural liberty which is a very old fashioned sounding phrase, but I like it, system of natural liberty. And in The Wealth of Nations, he advocated more or less for this system of natural liberty, which today we would call free markets. Uh, and what Russ, Russ described last night is what's, what Smith meant by system of natural liberty. Um, and you know, what did he mean by that? Well, he meant private property, not state owned enterprises, privately owned businesses, privately owned farms, privately owned fishing boats and fleets and, privately owned mills and factories and whatever and whatever. And then markets, people buying and selling amongst themselves, markets would be the way in which things would sort of get done. And Smith was in favor of free markets. And we'll talk a little bit more about Smith in a minute, but he had that idea. And Smith was not an anarchist either. He, he actually had a, a, a role for government. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So we had Smith, he created really the book, the, the template the, the recipe for what we today call capitalism. If you, I, I, that's not a term I like. And the reason I don't like it is because there's another guy, Marx, that came along not long after Smith, just a few generations later. And Marx said that Smith was wrong. Because Marx said in The Wealth of Nations that if you have this system of natural liberty, this private property and markets and trade, that system will work pretty well. He wasn't a utopian, but he thought it would work OK. It would work like the wealth of the nation would be larger, hence the name of the book. Uh, but Smith, or excuse me, Marx thought that Smith was wrong about capitalism. In fact, according to Marx, 
although capitalism would be productive, it would make a lot of stuff, there would be all these contradictions in, in capitalism. If you've studied Marx, I kind of hope you haven't, although we all should study Marx a little bit, if only so we know what, what, how he was wrong. But Marx said, well, if you have capitalism, you're going to have business cycles, periods of profit and loss, and progressively mo uh, movement towards monopolization and exploitation of the poor. Um, and eventually, according to Marx, the system's going to be so bad for so many people that those people will violently rise up and overthrow their capitalist overlords. So we have these two figures, the two most important figures in the history of economics, Adam Smith and Karl Marx. Smith said, hey, free markets kind of work. We should have them. And Marx says, no, free markets not only don't work, people are really going to hate it. It's going to be really, really oppressive. Now, somebody's wrong here. These are two contradictory views of the world. To me, they're both wrong. Maybe neither one is correct, but they both cannot be correct simultaneously. They're, both, they're saying completely opposite things. Um, and we've been arguing about, about it ever since. <laughs> and the character of the argument <clears throat> that I... Uh, is very much like this little meme I've got down here. And I remember when I was a college student at Ohio University, go Bobcats, that's our thing. And uh, it was a, a, a money, I had friends who were, were Marxists, who were communists. I mean that literally, they would wear red armbands on May Day and march through campus with pictures of Mao. I swear, that's true. The 1980s was a different time than today. I don't think anybody walks, even today, no one walks around with pictures of Mao. But I had friends who were, were card-carrying members of the Communist Party USA. And they were good friends of mine. We would, you know, college students, we would drink a beer, and I, we would argue about these ideas that we were learning about in our classes and just becoming more aware of as adults. But the character of our arguments, maybe it was the beer, but the character of the arguments was very much like the people there. I would say something and they would say, no, that's not true. And then they would say something I'm like, is not, is to, is not. And a couple more beers later, they would call me a name like a dirty capitalist pig and I would call them a commie pinko or something. These are my favorite memories of college. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I didn't convince any of my friends that they should become Adam Smith lovers and they didn't convince me that I should become a Karl Marx lover. And this was when we were doing, but if, you, if you're on Facebook or Twitter, God forbid, uh, or one of these things, uh, this is, it's still like that, right? It's a lot of name calling, a lot of finger pointing, a lot of is to, is nots. There's a lot of heat, but there's not a lot of light being generated in these conversations. So I'd like to contrast that with the natural sciences. I got a little picture for them, those guys, a couple of white lab coat guys. I'm a frustrated physicist. If I was a little smarter, I would be, I'd be doing an astrophysics lecture right now. But when one isn't smart enough to go into astrophysics, one goes into economics instead. So here we are. But I, have, I, I do attend physics lectures and seminars at the SMU physics department. It's a very good program. Uh, they have a PhD program. They do seminars every week. And I attend, and they're very kind to let me attend. And I sit in the back, and I, I kind of pretend to know what they're talking about. <laughs> But uh, I noticed that physicists also argue with each other. Um, there's the group of astrophysicists will argue with each other. You know, there, it could be different arguments, but one type of argument would be there's some data that they've gotten perhaps from, it's, maybe they've gotten some new data from the Hubble, or they've got new, new radio telescope data. And they're arguing about <clears throat> what the source of that data is, what that star or black hole or whatever, whatever, whatever is emanating that source, what is it doing? What's the process for that? And one physicists will have this view, well, this is, the, this is the process that's generating that signal. Another one will say, no, actually, I think it's this process generating the signal. And they'll argue about that. Now, at the end of the day, and those arguments actually can get a little bit testy, a little heated, right? It's, it's kind of strange, but they, they actually get, people dig in. They get, they have their, my view is right. But at the end of the day, we all know, how are they going to settle the argument? They're going to get more data. Uh, now, that data may be observational data. Astrophysics is primarily an observational data science. They just observe the, the signals. And, but the more data they get, the more they'll be able to discern whether, whether the astrophysics theory A is correct or the physics theory, astrophysics theory B is correct, the, the application of ever more data. Another few 
Another few hours of Hubble telescope looking at the, that star, that'll tell us. With a few more hours of data, we'll be able to get the answer. Um, we don't do that enough in social sciences and economics. We just argue with each other and call each other names like Kami Pinko. I would like us to be more like natural scientists and less like Facebook. <laughs> Now, there are deep differences between economics and the social sciences and natural sciences. There are ethical differences, all kinds of differences. But to the extent possible, I think we should be acting more like natural scientists. We should be handling our disputes. Uh, certainly, we handle our disputes with, with logic and argument about models and theories. But at the end of the day, we should be applying, uh, we should be looking at the real world that we live in, the data that we get, and, and sort of hitting our theories with that data. So that brings me to the index then. So we wanted to create an economic freedom index because we want to settle the debate between Smith and Marx, not with another 200 years of name calling, but we want to settle it with hopefully less than 200 years of data. data. So this is a data kind of thing. So I want to measure economic freedom. Sounds like it's a hard thing to do. Uh, freedom is kind of a fuzzy word. Um, we take some time in the report, in the publication that we have, we take some time to, de to define it. Um, <clears throat> but it's a fuzzy word. And it means different things to different people. And I'm going to go with Russ Roberts's sort of definition. It's, hey, it's leaving people alone to buy, sell, and exchange, hire and fire, invest in, in, a, in markets. This is what we mean by it. Other people may use the word freedom in different ways. That's the way we're using it, okay? But I want to put a number on it, and that seems like it's going to be hard, and it's not easy. I mean, if it was really easy, someone would have done it before we started doing it. But the, 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 the point is that we put numbers on things that are fuzzy all the time. Now, this is an American example, but we, put a, we, we declare who the best college American football team is. And the way they do that is there's some voters who select the best four teams. Now, and then those four teams play each other, and then the winners of that game plays each other again. And that's how we determine the number one. We measure the number one team is whoever gets voted in, and then whoever wins two games. That's how we decide it. And no one likes it. No one thinks it's the correct way and, the, and every year, the, whoever that winner is, whoever was, got voted in and whoever wins two games, every year there's going to be huge arguments on the internet usually and elsewhere about why, why the team that actually we measured to be number one wasn't number one. Why well, it should have been this other group or something like that. Um, okay, fine. We measure GDP, gross domestic product. This is more of an economics example. And if you've ever studied GDP, you know it's a fuzzy concept. And there's all kinds of problems with it, right? I mean, it's easy to define it. It's the dollar value or, I guess, the shekel value of all the new final goods and services produced in the country in a year, gross domestic product. It's easy to say, but when you start thinking about it, like we know when I teach it to my students, right after I teach the definition, I spend the entire rest of the class on all the problems with it, all the things that GDP measures correct, incorrectly, all the things that are in GDP that shouldn't be in it, and all the things that are not in it that should be in it, and, such, and so we know it's a flawed measure. <clears throat> but I think most people, most economists for sure, think we're better off having a measure of GDP than not having one, even though we know the measure we have is wrong. It's wrong in, in important ways that we, we actually know about. <clears throat> we're gonna do it wrong next year too, <laughs> right? And we're gonna compare next year's wrong number with this year's wrong number, and the difference is gonna tell us whether we had economic growth or we had a recession. So we put numbers on fuzzy things all the time, and we know, but the goal is, hopefully, even a fuzzy number is something, is some information. We're gonna learn something. So let's talk about how I do the numbers. So <clears throat> it's the most boring book ever written. The Economic Freedom of the World has now been coming out every year since 1996. If you open the book, which it's a little thick, so I don't usually bring it on airplanes. It's, it weighs a pound or two. I'm trying to go lighter. But if you open the book, it's like 165 pages of tables, of numbers. <laughs> and it's dull and boring. But it's, in, it's a data-driven index. Um, 
and I'll show you when, uh, what is it, Wednesday I talk again, I'll do, I'll do a sort of more Israeli specific conversation about the data. So there's five areas of the index and there's 42 variables. And there's 165 countries and we have data back to 1970. Actually, we have some data back to 1950 in a separate report, uh, but you go that far back, it gets really sketchy, so we don't put it in the main report. But in a sense, we've got data back to 1950. So it's a very large number of countries. It's a large number of variables, currently 42, uh, and a large time series, a large time frame that we have. And I'm not going to go through all 42 variables, because you would murder me if I did that. But I want to go through just some of the things that are in the index, give you an idea of what we try, are trying to capture, what we do capture in the index. And the five areas of the index are up on the board. So that's size of government, how big is the government, property rights, monetary, mon the monetary system, free trade internationally, and what's the regulatory system like. Those are the five areas. And within those five areas, we have those 42 variables are slotted into one of those five areas. So area one, which is the size of government, I think has A, B, C, D, E, five, um, five parts. Okay, there's five things in area one. I think there's nine things in area two and, and so forth. <clears throat> so let me talk about each one just a little bit and give you a couple examples of what's in there. So size of government, how big, we're talking about fiscal size, tax and spend. How much money does the government take from people and then spend? And, <clears throat> you know, Russ Roberts mentioned that we're not anarchists, but we are kind of limited government people. Adam Smith was a limited government pe person. He wrote a whole chapter in the Wealth of Nations on public finances, and it's a short chapter because Adam Smith was a small government guy. If you read the Wealth of Nations, the chapters that Smith wrote on public finances, he says government should raise taxes and spend money on national defense, to, in his era, to keep the French from invading. <laughs> Cops, police officers, to settle, you know, to keep the peace. So when the, you know, when the bars close in Edinburgh, Scotland, and people start fighting in the, in the streets because they've been drinking too much and people start fighting, we have police to settle the, to stop the fighting. And then we have courts, judges, because if, I, if we disagree about who owns this cow and you know, I think it's my cow, but you think it's your cow. Rather than have a fight about it in the street, we just go to a judge and say, judge, whose cow is that? And the judge will review the evidence and hopefully rule fairly. So we've got national defense, cops, and judges, courts. And, and that's the classic things you should think of when you think of the role of government. And Smith keeps going. He says, well, we should have what we might today call infrastructure. Uh, if you've studied formal economics, and you've studied the formal concept that economists call public goods. Smith actually had a really good, uh, sophisticated, and modern understanding of public goods. Now, in his era, that would have been basically roads and bridges. We might expand it today to include some other things, perhaps ports and airports and maybe a few things. But there's a, a few items that economists and Smith think the market might not be very good at providing, but we still might want to have them provided. So the, 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 so the, if the government, if the, if the private, if private entrepreneurs, if for-profit businesses won't provide roads and bridges, then we'll have the government do it. And there's a very small class of products we call public goods, if you've studied the formal economics, that, that fits that, that bill, okay? And then he talks about schools. Uh, Smith did say that he thought there was a role for government to raise money in uh, taxes and spend money on schools. Uh, he wasn't really happy, just like today, in Russ's comments last night, he wasn't really happy with the quality of that system, and even in his time. Uh, there's a little fun story that when Smith was an under, what we would today call an undergraduate, when he was a younger student uh, in, in, in university uh, in Scotland, the practice in Scotland was that the students would pay the professors directly every day. Like, you attended lecture, you would come with your, your, your money, and you would like tip him. You're like, you say, good lecture, here's your money. Um, this is a terrifying thing. I hope it never returns. But after he finishes schooling in, in Scotland, he, he went down to Oxford for, for what we would today call his graduate studies. 
And you get to Oxford, and the Oxford professors didn't draw sal didn't get paid directly by the students. They drew a salary from the treasury or from the church or whoever owns Oxford. And, and it turns out the professors at Oxford were boring, dull. They would walk into class, you know, in their like black robes, you know, and they would open up a book and they would read the book. Like that was the lecture. And Smith is, is like, he's, he was immediately complaining, writing letters home, we still have some of these letters, complaining about how boring and dull the professors in Oxford were. And because they were drawing just salaries and it didn't really matter whether they taught, if they taught bad classes or good classes, it didn't matter, they got paid. Well, what happened if you were a bad lecturer in Scotland? No one shows up to your class and you don't eat tonight, right? Because your, your income was based on giving a, a, a vibrant lecture, an, an interesting lecture to the students. So uh, he had a lot of complaints about the English uh, system and thought the Scottish system of university pay was, was superior. But leaving aside all that, he was in favor of at least some government support for education. But then the chapter's over. That's it. There are no daycare centers, no swimming pools, no recreation centers, no old age pensions. The city of Dallas, free market Texas, the city of Dallas where I live, owns a hotel. The Omni Hotel downtown is owned by the city of Dallas. Adam Smith didn't think governments should be owning and operating hotels. It wasn't on the list. We had courts, we had cops, national defense, maybe some roads and bridges and some schools. That was it. So if you compare Adam Smith's government to the government we actually have, like, Ad like the government we actually have is this big, the government that Smith advocated was this big. He was a small government guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's essentially what they're doing. What, for profit? So, they hmm? do it for profit, the hotel for Dallas? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, well, yeah. Not a bad idea, maybe. Yeah. Instead of taxes. Yeah, they, they, they do run, it's a for-profit firm. Uh, they have to pay taxes like they're a for-profit firm, so, yeah, yeah, it's very strange. Um, so, what do, I, what do I have here then? It's easy. I just have... IMF and World Bank have data on how big the government is. Even, I mean, all the countries in the world, even the really poor backward ones, you know, I can look up in a book, now it's on the internet, how much they tax and spend. And we do it in different ways. There's different ways of measuring it. And that, there's five different things we have in area one. But basically, it's how big is the government, how big are the taxes, and how much money are they spending. Uh, pretty straightforward. And, then I use an advanced branch of mathematics called arithmetic to convert the numbers that I get from the IMF into a zero to 10 score. So 10 is like, that's Adam Smith, and zero is the opposite of Adam Smith. So basically in this context then, a small government, a smaller government, nobody, no country has no government, but so a smaller government will have, will get a nine or a 10, and then big, the big government countries will get lower scores. So, you know, if you think about it, if you, if you look at the actual numbers, Sweden gets a pretty bad score in area one because Sweden has a pretty large fiscal government. Their taxes are high. The government spends a lot of money. They have a lot of they, swimming pools and daycare centers and kindergartens and everything. You know, the, the government's doing all kinds of things that, what, that Adam Smith didn't think uh, government should be doing. But, but what does that actually tell you about performance? Because the Swedish government performs better than, let's say, South America. I'm, I'm not measuring performance yet. I'm just measuring this thing called economic freedom or this thing that Adam Smith called the system of natural liberty. Once we have the measurement, then we can actually ask questions about performance. And that's really the point of the exercise. So who the, built this thing, the, the index itself? Hmm? Who built the index? I did. You did? Oh. Yeah. yeah, well, Jim, Jim Gortney and I, and now we have two, two other co-authors we've added since then, but Jim and I started this, yeah. And it's evolved. The index we have today is different than the one we started with in 1996. We've added variables. We've changed a little bit the way we do things and stuff. So um, the second area is property rights and rule of law. And it's the hardest area to measure because unlike government spending, which is an easy number, it's a number. You open up a book and it says the government had, this was taxes in, you know, Iran, you know, had this much taxes and this much government spending. Botswana had this much taxes and this government, this, it was easy. It's a number. Um, property rights, like how secure, how secure is your property? How worried about, like, suppose it's my cow, or 
it's actually my cow. But Bob back there says it's his cow. And we go to court. How trustworthy is that court? Because if the court's doing its job, the judge is going to say, it's my cow. Because it is my cow. That's mine. But Bob's trying to claim that it's his. So if I go to court in, in Texas, the hope is that judge is going to look at the facts of the case, interview some witnesses, and everyone's going to go to the court and say, yeah, it's uh, Lawson's cow. And the judge, if he's doing his job correctly, he'll rule for me. But in many countries, is that what happens? No, in many countries, the judge might be a Klansman or a family member of Bob Borens back there, in which case I, I'm going to lose my cow. He's going to steal my cow. He's going to use the court. I, that's not protecting my property, right? That's actually using the court to steal my property. So the point is, courts can be, if they're operating well, they can be a great way to protect property. But in some places, actually, the, the courts are part of the process where people steal property. So we have measures, but it's very fuzzy. It's, it's subjective. It's not easy to sell. So we have measures, though, that are mostly based on surveys. Not surveys that we do. I don't do any of my own surveying. But the World Economic Forum, for example, this, you know, the group in, in Switzerland, they have an executive opinion survey, EOS, and that forms the basis for the Global Competitiveness Report, if you've ever heard of that. When it comes out, it usually gets a lot of headlines. And the executive opinion survey asks people who are doing business in the countries, hundreds and hundreds of people in every country in the world, they ask them, Simple questions like, hey, how trustworthy are the judges? <laughs> how secure do you think your property is? Are you worried about governments nationalizing your property? If you own a, a farm, are you worried about the government you know, taking your farm? That kind of thing. So the, the numbers we have in the second, unlike the area of one, the numbers in the second area are more subjective, in the, not subjective in the sense that I'm making them up, but subjective in the sense that it's someone's opinion about, that, about the country. But that's the only way really to measure property rights, and rule of law. We don't. Uh, at the end of the day, we, we, have to sort of, we have to make a judgment call as to whether or not. Now, the good news is like, I have a sense that Swedish courts are pretty fair. Swedish judges are likely to be good. And so when I, when the, like, I'll do a couple, I'll do like, when I see a series, I, I open up a book, and I'm like, OK, it says property rights. I'm going to look, is Sweden good or bad? If Sweden's bad, I'm probably going to, I think the number's not. So I'm going to use a little bit of. Yeah, right. Well, <clears throat> but they're actually asking foreign businesses too. So, you know, and it is an, it is an anonymous survey as well. So now that'll be, a, this will be a limitation I'll have to admit later. Uh, there, are a couple, there are a couple really important countries that are not in my index, like Cuba and North Korea. Now, I. I know, if I'm doing an index of economic freedom, I know where North Korea goes. It goes last. But if you open up our report, there's no North Korea on the list. And that's, now you know why. Why is there no North Korea on the list? Because there are no World Economic Forum surveys being given of businesses in North Korea. So, uh, and if they did one, everyone would, would say, oh, it's great here, right? So, <laughs> So, so no, there's no question about it. Now, the other thing is we'll use multiple sources and multiple methods. The World Bank has uh, something called the Doing Business Project, which recently got canceled, but I have really, th I think it's going to get picked up by, by someone else. And that's a different process. So I've got World Economic Forum, PRS Group. I've got three, di four different sources. So, so the hope is that by using multiple different sources with different sort of methodologies, if one of them's bad, hopefully the other's you know, eight, if they're all, hopefully they're not all bad, all right? At the end of the day, it is a judgment call. We have to sort of evaluate whether we think the numbers are trustworthy. If I saw a bunch of numbers on property rights and Sweden was at the bottom and Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo was at the top, I would not trust those numbers. So at the end of the day, you sort of look at the numbers, do they feel right? That's the, that's the way it's, you know, I don't know how else to do it. Um, so uh, I should mention there's a little asterisk there. A couple of years ago, I think in, two, in 2017, we started to adjust these numbers for differential treatment of men versus women. Now, in almost everything in my index, there really isn't a distinguished, there's nothing to distinguish men from women. Like taxes, I don't, I don't know of any country in the world where there's a different tax rate for men than women. 
right? The VAT is the same for the men as it is for the women, right? Um, and many of the things we measure, there, you know, tariffs and such, there's just no difference, male and female, it's the same, same. But in the, in the property rights area. Actually, actually in this yeah. video, uh, Women have a reduced, uh, oh, sweet cheese. Really? Yeah. It's reduced? Yeah. There's a point system. There's a point system for... Uh, this point system. All right. Okay. I'm, I'm going to have to change my whole lecture now because of you guys. Um, but there are, there are countries... The most common practice, though, would be to have differences in regulatory or legal access to the legal system. There, I mean, there are countries where women cannot sue without their husband or father being a party to the lawsuit, right? That you can't, just as a single woman, or woman you just can't go in and file a lawsuit. You, you don't have access to the legal system in the same way that a man has access to the legal system. Uh, there are many, in the labor markets, there are lots of areas where women may be allowed, not allowed to work at night and men can work at night. So we have, a, we've, the World Bank has the whole battery of lists. I think we have 17 factors. And what we do is we take the area two rating and we sort of adjust it. Now, so the United States, for example, as a matter of law, I'm not saying we treat women the same as we treat men as in culture, but as a matter of law, there's no differences in American law between men and women. So it, we get a, you, so we multiply area two score by one, just the same number, doesn't, nothing happens. But in Saudi Arabia, where, although it's gotten better, actually, the reforms there are real. And I keep asking, and apparently they're really doing some better work on this front. But, it, but when we first started, in Saudi Arabia, we're, like, there were almost, of the 17 things, like 14 of them were, women were being treated worse than, than the men. And so their area two rating basically got, got hit with a punch, and we, we multiplied their rating by like 0.4 or something. So their, their score went down. So, we are, we are, you know, that's the one area where we do sort of, it's kind of ad hoc, but we, we knew that we wanted to deal with that because we had some countries that, uh, well, frankly, some Arab countries who were scoring pretty well on the index, but then we're thinking, that's really only true for about half the population. You know, the other half, eh, it's not nearly as good a situation. So, so we, 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 we introduced this new gender adjustment thing, and if, if, if you were interested in that, I can show you the details offline. The third area is access to sound money. And um, <clears throat> let, me, let me tell a, a, a little anecdote. When I turned 16, in, in America, you can begin driving when you're 16. And uh, I got my driver's license, and my dad said, you should get a $100 bill. And I, I want to emphasize, my dad did not give me a $100 bill. I did not have the kind of dad that was handing out $100 bills. But he said I should get it a $100 bill. I don't know where I was going to get it, but he thought I should get it. And then I should hot fold it up and slide it into a, a small corner of your wallet and for, try to forget about it. And the idea was that this is the 1980s. There are no cell phones. Uh, there are, I didn't have a Visa card. <laughs> and, and I drove a 1974 Volkswagen Beetle that broke down a lot. I still have two old Volkswagen Beetles, by the way, that are even older than that, but, and they break down a lot still. But the point is $100 was gonna be like an insurance policy. If your car broke down and you needed a tow or need to pay a mechanic to fix, help you fix the car, maybe bribe a cop. I don't know what my dad thought I but was gonna get doing. And it was good, it actually was good advice back in the day before we had you know, Visa cards uh, to get us out of trouble, uh, to carry around a little extra cash for emergency purposes. But here's the problem. We all know what the problem is. What if I did that and a year went by and I, fi I, I find that $100 in my wallet after a year? We all know what the problem is, right? What's, yeah, it's worth less a year later. If inflation has been 5%, and I, I must say that sounds nice right now in America, <laughs> uh, but if inflation has been 5%, we know that that $100 bill, although it's literally the same physical $100 bill a year later as it was the year pre pre prior, that that $100 bill is only going to be buy 95% as much stuff at the store a year later as it would have bought a year before. It's like someone took $5 out of your wallet. It's like a tax. It's a 5% inflation rate, rate acts like a 5% tax on that $100 bill in your wallet. In fact, any asset that you have that is denominated in dollars, when that's, think about the pieces of paper that float around this planet that have dollar numbers written on them. Leases, 
insurance policies, mortgages, bonds, trillions upon trillions upon trillions of dollars of assets have dollar, and every one of those assets, the value of those assets can be taxed away by inflation. Monetary economists call it the inflation tax for a reason. So the third area is, it's not only inflation, but the main point about the third area is that we're trying to get at how secure your property is from sort of having the monetary system take value from you, from your savings account or, or, or your bond contract or, or whatever. <clears throat> and mostly it's basically, inflation's one number. We have some other numbers. Another variable that's in the third area is, are you allowed to own a foreign currency bank account? Now, uh, in the United States, uh, it's legal for me to go to Chase uh, Bank and open up an account denominated in yen or euro. Probably shekel, I don't know. I think so, probably. They don't care. They'll open an account for me in whatever currency, and the government's fine with that. I could also, as a matter of law, go to Japan and open up an account in yen there. So the US government allows, gives me the freedom to open up and hold my sort of savings, my wealth, hold it in foreign currency denominated bank accounts. But you might not know this, but a lot of countries don't. A lot of countries in the world prohibit their citizens from owning other people's currencies in, like in, a, in a bank account. So one of the areas in this third, one of the components, one of the variables is, can you own a foreign currency bank account, either in your own country or abroad? In some places, it's, you can own it domestically, but not abroad, or, or you know, it's sort of, it's, you yeah. know, yeah. On the sound money uh, side, how do you think you're going to be able to integrate the kind of inflation we have, uh, depending on what caused it, right? So the inflation... Uh, yeah. I don't care. <laughs> you don't care? So I, I, because the, the difference between, yeah. for instance, European inflation is, is, is less so inflation than it is, like, you know, so much shock, versus the U.S. where you do have... Yeah, so it's, it's very crude. The answer is going to be that we don't make any adjustments for it. Inflation is inflation is inflation to us. Um, we're kind of hanging our hat on the view that inflation is always a monetary phenomenon and therefore it's always the cause by the, by, by the government because the governments are in control of the monetary systems everywhere. Now, I realize that in the short term that may not be technically true, but you know, a little bit, of, you know, look, if you had a 3% inflation rate, you're going to get like a 9.7 out of 10. It's not that bad. Okay, there, this, this is scored in a very forgiving way. So you can have some inflation, like normal inflation, and not get too bad. You start having a lot of inflation, double digits and stuff, your numbers go down pretty, pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, how would you measure this, for instance, uh, in Turkey, where the government says the inflation is one thing and... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so that's a great question. So we measure, so we don't just do inflation, we have a measurement in there of money, money supply relative to the size of the economy. And the reason we have that is precisely because of those countries that are, either have a lot of price controls or they're fudging their inflation numbers, which a lot of countries do. So that's one, another way to get it. Now maybe they're fudging, if they're fudging all the numbers, we're, we're just, we're hopeless. But most, Turkey's monetary numbers are, I think, believable. And I, I know what their economy is doing. So I mean, if you've got a money supply growing at 200% a year, but your economy is only growing at 2% a year, and then you try to tell me inflation is only 5%, there's something wrong, right? So, so we have another component. We're trying to sort of deal with that. Uh, there's a one country, though, the, uh, is Argentina. Argentina is notorious for, for lying about their inflation rate. Uh, and the banking, the private banking system in Argentina has a privately produced <laughs> inflation rate measure. And we use that instead of the government's measure because it's a very believable number. But uh, otherwise, we were kind of stuck with the government numbers. Yeah. It's a bit of a theoretical question, but is there a centralized way to control the money? Like, hypothetically, can, can uh, not the government control the money? Like, have a free market of money well, supply? Yeah, so the reality is every country in the world, the government is in control of the decision of how we control the money supply. Now, there are only a few, there are, and in most countries, the government literally controls the money supply. Yeah. Just literally, yeah, and, and we, well, I mean, there are a couple countries that have dollarized, and all that means, though, is that they've turned over their monetary policy to the U.S. government, which is still a, 
a collective choice. Uh, in the old days, we had private money. I mean, you know, more or less. But today, the answer is really no. I mean, I think, the, can we? The, oh, of course, yes, we could. Uh, I'm a big fan of private monetary systems. And, you know, I know Bitcoin people want to make the claim that Bitcoin's going to become this, and I, I wish them well. I hope that, hope it win, you know, but I, the reality is right now, that's not something, there's no variation there. Every country in the world basically has got a government run monetary system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain how to give a number to this? Uh... Yeah, so um, <clears throat> the, the normal way, and this, there are a couple exceptions, I have a whole technical appendix where we, like, but the normal way is, so like, for example, let's say government spending. Let's suppose the highest government spending was 60% of however we measure it, and the lowest was 20%. Suppose the range of the data was 20% to 60%. And we want to score the 60% low, lower scores. So what we do is we basically write a formula that says whatever the highest country was, that's the zero. And whatever the lowest government spending country was, that's the 10. And then it's basically a straight line like we did the formula just does this. So the idea is that whatever the data says, the, the actual data, whatever units the data come in, whatever the unit is for the data, we try to map that onto a zero to 10 scale, just straight line. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions to that rule, but that's the general way it's done. So the idea is that the data, although they're index numbers, uh, for a lot of the data, like a two means literally twice as much as a, as a, as a as a four, right? I mean, or in terms of government spending, because it's backwards. Does that make sense? Yeah, but in access to sound money, you have a lot of zero or one. You can have yeah. a, a bank account abroad. Or you yeah, yeah, so that's the except, what's one of the exceptions. So that's literally a zero, five, 10. It's, you get, if, you, if you're free to hold, hold foreign currency bank accounts you, in both domestically and abroad, you get a 10. If it's one or the other, it's a five. If it's neither, you get a zero. So there are a couple exceptions where it's, it's more, um, it's more discreet, but, but most of the variables are pretty continuous, so it just maps on like nicely. Yes, sir. There's a final score. Yeah, at the end of the day, we just do a bunch of averages. It's average, all of the parameters are averages of averages of averages. The subjective uh, parameters so. are not; they're equally. Yeah. So I take I've got five numbers in area one. Those are I take the average of those five numbers, and that becomes the score for area one. I have nine numbers in area two. I take the average of those nine numbers, that's area two. And then I get five areas, and I take the average of those five areas to get an overall number. So it's, there are other ways to do this, and I'm not defending, I don't think we've done it, the only, infinite number of ways to do this. That's the way we do it. We just do it with simply averages of averages of averages. Yes? You have given two, two examples of access to sound of money. First one was the country that allow you to hold an uh, account in different currency, and the second one was the, the, inflate, the tax of inflation that happened in every country. What is the connection between them? Well, it's, we're thinking here, well, the connection there is that suppose you've got a government that is printing a lot of money and cre therefore creating a lot of inflation, uh, that's going to put your, your assets subject to this inflation tax. But if you can hold at least some of your wealth in another currency, that acts as a nice hedge. And so it's a safety valve. Uh, and we think, you know, like Venezuela, for example, has high inflation, and Venezuela's government does not let Venezuelans hold foreign currency bank accounts domestically or abroad. But what if Venezuela's government did let people have? Well, then it'd be better for them. It would still be bad because inflation's good, but it'd be better. Yeah, it's happened in Israel in the past. Yeah. Right. In Israel 40 years ago. Yeah, right, so yeah, which I'll talk a little bit about next week, or a couple of days. The fourth area is, um, well, that's the area that I think you should think of when you think of Adam Smith, right? Adam Smith, by no means was it his only thing, The Wealth of Nations is a very big book, but the biggest thing that Adam Smith was advocating in The Wealth of Nations was for free trade. And that was a very audacious kind of extreme argument in his period, his time, just as it is today, right? Uh, but he, had the, he was wanting to argue that mo mostly he was arguing that the, f that the English and British more generally should trade with the French. And, you know, that's a, not an easy argument. The French and the British had been bitter, bitter enemies for hundreds of years, right? So, um, but, you know, there's a, one of my favorite lines in, in um, The Wealth of Nations is he was kind of complaining about, like, you know, we could make wine in Scotland. 
but it'd be like 30 times more expensive than the wine they make in France. You know, in his theory, the theory of free trade is like, it makes more sense for us to buy low and sell high. Buy low, buy the cheap wine from the French, and we'll sell them something. We'll sell them wool, because we make good wool in Scotland. So he was a free trader. Um, he advocated free trade, re massive reductions in barriers to trade. Uh, and as you might imagine, we're going to basically go to the WTO uh, to get tariff rate data. Uh, we measured the average tariff rate from the World Trade Organization. Uh, we also measured the standard deviation of the, like if you've got like some tariff rates at 1,000% and others at 0%, that means you're really playing political games with, with different products, right? If everything, Chile is an example of a country that has a pretty high average tariff, but it's across the board the same. It's like it's 8% or something. It's like literally just 8%, it's like a VAT, it's like a sales tax. So, but they don't have any that are 100 they, and zero, they, it's eight across the board. So eight's actually high, so they don't do really well there, but they get a really good score in the standard deviation because there's no standard deviation, there's no variation at all. Um, we also have some capital control measures here. It's not just the interferences in, that, on goods and, and exports and imports, but also capital, capital flows, investment flows. How do you consider bans on the Yeah, so an outright ban is pretty hard for us to measure, but there are, there are two, two, <clears throat> two variables we have on non-tariff barriers, and they're surveys, um, for, both from the world, one from the World Bank and one from the World Economic Forum. Uh, they're surveys. And a ban, we hope, I, I, I don't know, we hope, though, that the surveys would capture, if you're banning a lot of products, it's like simply, it's like an, like an infinite, ta infinite tariff rate, right? We hope that, the, that, that those two components would pick it up. There's also another one, and this is gonna, <laughs> that really took a hit this year, um, uh, is we have, a vari we have one variable on, uh, t it's, it, it's like one third of one fifth, it's very small weight in terms of the weighting but it's on, on travel. Uh, are you free to travel without a visa? Can you, can you enter the country without a visa? Um, and because we, like, we're trying to get it, like, how easy is it to move, like, a crate of bananas across the border? And that's the goods and services, tariffs, quotas, things like that. And then it's capital flows, investment, how easy is it to move, like, financial resources from A to B? But also, I'm like, people, what about people? Can we move, can I cr enter the country without a visa? Um, the U.S., as you probably know, gets a very bad score there because we have a terrible restrictive visa regime in the United States. Guess what happened in COVID's year, though, for that variable? Because <laughs> we, I mean, if you have to take a, a medical test, we consider that to be at least as onerous as a visa requirement. So that number really took a huge hit. Um, I mean, almost every country went to zero in 2020. How do you know the visa so, number is good or bad? I mean, people, uh, illegal immigrants want to get to Sweden, but they don't want to get to uh, Pakistan. So, so how do you know the number? Is good or I'm, bad? Not, I'm not evaluating good or bad here. I'm just evaluating freedom. Yeah, it's at the end of the day, we're going to want to make an evaluation about whether this is good or bad. Um, this is true of all the variables. Like area one, like you mentioned it earlier. Like, how do I know if the spend? Hey, the spending is good. It's if you're going to have government spending, I'd rather they spend it on good things efficiently, rather than like you know, bullets to shoot people, which is what some governments spend their money on. But that's, uh, to me, that, that's the, the quality of the, of the spending or the quality of the government. I'm just talking about the, yeah. It's, but you're, you're correct. At the end of the day, we want to look at that. The last one is regulation of credit markets. It's basically <coughs> banking, uh, labor markets, and just general business regulations. This gets a lot of surveys and a lot of the sort of softer things. Um, the credit market one, though, is pretty hard because it's basically like interest rate controls, which aren't really common today. But going back in time, it was really common to have interest rate controls. Even the United States had interest rate controls on like bank accounts, domestic bank accounts. Uh, we don't have that now, but we did in the 70s. And so mo today, most countries have deregulated interest rates. But historically, you know, back if I go back to 1970, 75 data, you'll see a lot of countries would score badly there. And now they get tens, but they were getting twos or fives back in the old days. Um, we have a variable in area in five uh, on banking, like uh, ownership of banks, like what percentage of the banks are owned by the government? 
in China, that's 100%, <laughs> right? So China gets a very bad score there because every bank in China is owned by the government. There are no private banks domestically. In the United States, I think that number is um, zero, like no, no government-run banks. So, although we could argue that point. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, it's not a commercial bank, though. I mean, we're talking about commercial, like retail commercial banks. Um, labor markets, we've got variables from the, uh, from the World Bank mainly. Uh, also, the World Economic Forum here, too, on minimum wage, uh, as Russ Roberts mentioned last night. We consider that to be an infringement on the freedom of employers and employees to set wages at mutually agreeable prices. Um, there are arguments for and against the minimum wage, but it's a, it's a violation of that freedom thing that we, we're trying to measure here. Yeah. Yeah, we have one variable on unionization. It's basically, the, it's from the World Economic Forum, it's basically what share of the labor force is unionized. And it doesn't, like, you don't get to immediately go to zero, but um, <clears throat> there are, it takes a government to really unionize an economy. Unionization rates without government support for unions would be very low in most places. Uh, so if you get to 20, 30, 40% of your, of your labor force, 50% of your labor force unionized, that is because the government actually has a very pro, they're basically forcing unions on people. If it's 2% of your labor force, that would be like, you know, it's fine, but you know, it's, it's, we do have one variable there, yeah. Sorry, uh, we'll go you first. And hey, how do you adjust the rules against discrimination in the labor force or something? Yeah, we don't have a variable on that. And I think part of the reason is we're not sure what we would view, what we, how we would view it. We don't have a variable on it. I don't even know of a variable for that. So even if I wanted to put it in the index, I don't, I don't think there is such a, a number. I, again, I gotta get 165 countries. Um, yeah, should you have a question? Yeah, that's, um, continuing the unionization, do you differentiate different kinds of unionization? In Israel and Sweden, the unionization of workers is, is very different. Yeah. And the way it's managed, the way it's managed via the government, government subsidies, direct and indirect, the forcing of unionization. We had a lot of unions in Israel that told the workers, uh, we just collectively decided on doing the strike or whatever, and right. if you ban us, we're going to make sure you, you'll be out of job, which is unheard of as well. So yeah, so the short answer is no. Uh, we, we really don't. Uh, discrimination, you, you could measure affirmative action, whether affirmative action. Yeah, I don't know how I get that for Botswana. I mean, that's, the, 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 the Congo is my test. If you, if you, if you say to me, you should put this in the index, my first answer is, can I get that for Congo? Because, <laughs> frankly, that's the problem. So, so yeah, because we want to do a large number of countries, the we can't get too detailed in the index. The index is going to be very kind of very superficial. So let me um, try to try to get through here. Uh, I, oops, wrong direction because I'm holding it backwards. So Hong Kong is number one. I knew this without doing an index. The top tax rate in Hong Kong is 20%. Top tax rate. Billionaires in Hong Kong max out at 20% marginal income tax rates. The government of Hong Kong does have a government. They do a lot of things, probably bigger than Adam Smith wanted it, but it's pretty small by, global, by, stand, by the global standards. Property rights are very secure there. Uh, the courts are very fa fair. If you sue someone in Hong Kong, the judge is gonna rule on the facts as fairly as he can. Um, monetary system, pretty stable. Free trade, zero tariffs, no tariffs at all. 0.0, .0. they have no tariffs on anything. No quotas, nothing. Um, the regulations are low. Hong Kong, I knew, no, I knew that. I didn't need the index to know that. Then it gets a little harder. Well, who's number two? Who's number three? Well, it's Singapore is second, and then it goes on through there. And if you look at the list, yeah, you know, if, you, if I were to ask you, like, okay, name the most market-oriented countries, you probably would have said, oh, okay, Hong Kong, Singapore, U.S., maybe U.K., okay, yeah, we're all, we're all right. Um, Switzerland, there are a couple weirdos. Uh, two former Soviet republics are now making the top 10, Georgia and Lithuania. Georgia is gonna go out of the top 10 next year, but they're gonna be like 12th, so it's still pretty high. So that's pretty cool. But most of the countries are, are pretty, pretty good. Um, we're worried about Hong Kong going down, I and mean, you've all seen the crackdown. Most of that crackdown's on the political side, though. It's not like that Beijing is interfering on the tariff side or on the taxes and stuff like that. So the things that we are measuring in our index 
Beijing is not really interfering with. So I'm not expecting our index to really get crushed by the Chinese crackdown, because that's mostly a political crackdown, I'm, which I think is really important to talk about, but that's not what our index is looking at. Um, the lowest countries, Venezuela's last, 165 out of 165. Uh, most of the rest of the countries there, you see Iran is very low, notwithstanding that you can sell your kidney there. You can't do much, you can't really sell any, buy or sell anything else, apparently, according to our numbers. Um, so mostly African countries. Uh, Argentina is not on there, but I think Argentina is like just slightly out of that range. This is the top and the bottom. Here's a, uh, some of the bigger countries. Uh, U.S. is sixth, as you saw earlier. Germany, Chile is the highest rated Latin American country. They're 29th uh, with a 7.85 score. Uh, Israel, I, I don't normally put Israel in the slide because frankly, no one cares outside of, <laughs> but uh, I mean, I put it in for you guys. Uh, it's 43rd or the 7.63, and it's actually, uh, <clears throat> the colors are quartiles, so blue is the top 25%, green is the second 25%, yellow is the third, and red is the last. Uh, uh, on, in the last report, Israel was the highest rated green country. They were right on the border of being blue, like one, one little bit they would have been blue. So in terms of the, the colors that we have, so I went ahead and sort of made it a greenish blue thing, because it's right on that border. <laughs> I don't know, I have next year's numbers, but I don't know really if it's gonna make the blue cut or the green cut, because you know, if you're right there, a little bit, of, it's not just what you do, if somebody above you got worse, you might, you might, you yeah. know. It's, it's like the double A and triple A. Yeah, yeah, yes, Nira. It's, it's a relative um, reading, right? Because I'm thinking about what you're gonna find next, like next, well, so, the next iteration. Yeah, so. everyone got more right. government, more spending, more regulation, yeah. more interference, yeah. freedom, more, more right. of everything. And I, and I kind of wonder, it yeah. may not change so much anything. The, so yeah, oh, you're talking about the COVID year. Okay, you're talking about COVID or like the most I'm recent? Okay, about. yeah, so yeah, it's uh, relatives, yeah, yes. Uh, the ranking actually, this is, my numbers here I'm showing you are 2018 numbers. Actually, this, that's wrong. That should say 2019, because I'm always two years behind with my data. It takes a year for the World Bank to get the numbers. It takes me a year to get the numbers and publish them. So I'm always two years behind. So this year, I'm doing 2020, which is the... I'm, I'm kind of yes. wondering if, if in your index you have a way to kind of show the evolution yes. over time. Yes. Not just of the relative... <laughs> yes, yes, I'll show that in a second, yes. How low can you get before you leave the developed world? Uh, it's a continuum. I mean, I, I don't know where the bright line is between developed and developed. I, I, you know, people make up things. OECD is one line, but I, look, uh, look, some of these countries in the blue, I mean, Georgia is very poor. So just because you're a economically freak place doesn't mean you're rich yet. Georgia's only been economically free for a few years, so it's, yeah, let me, hmm? That's a mistake. I know why, because I was trying to change Israel's bar last night. And I, I, I just realized I accidentally changed Venezuela's bar. It should be red. Yeah. <laughs> Could you give some insight on uh, what's bringing uh, Israel down? Like yeah. Actually, the entire talk on Wednesday is about that. Um, so if you'll let me sort of defer that answer, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, this is the world map. Um, this is the cover. Just those quartiles. It is all relative. And so one of the things, when I do the 2020 numbers, which I just finished, like, this week, uh, but I'm not allowed to show them to you yet. I'm going to show you a little bit, but not much. Um, the rankings don't change much. If everybody, everybody goes down, the rankings don't. But the numbers do, do, do change. I'll show you that graph here. You're going you're gonna to love it. Uh, in fact, there it is. This is uh, illegal. I'm not allowed to show this, but I'm showing it anyway, so don't take a cell phone picture of this. But this is what the world average since 2000 is done. So it's been going up, even into 2000s. If I do a longer period, I lose some countries. So this is, I like this, um, but you know, the world's getting econom more economically free. Even in the two since 2000, there's still a push towards lower taxes and privatizations, lower tariffs. Uh, you know, it's not as aggressive as it was in the 80s and 90s, but it's pretty, it's still going. <laughs> but the 2020 number is gonna be, like we're gonna give up 10 years worth of economic freedom score. In, in the 2020 number. Um, so that's the, you're the first people on the planet outside of my office to see that graph. Um, 
So this is going to get to the stuff that I think we really care about. Now that we have the index, and this is very crude, I'll get to some more advanced stuff in just a second, but the question then is, hey, is the economic freedom good or bad? Is it working or not working? Was Adam Smith right when he said that the system of natural liberty was going to be pretty good, or was he wrong? Or was Marx right? Marx said the system of natural, uh, system of natural liberty, capitalism, would be bad. And who's right? Well, it turns out Smith is going to be right on that empirical, on this empirical question. So I've just got some charts. These are, the, these are low tech. I'll show you some evidence from the higher tech stuff in a second. But just using those four groups, very crude. Um, blue countries, top 25%. Green is the second 25%. So blue and green is the top half. Red and yellow are the bottom half. Okay. If top one is GDP per capita, that's the dollar bills that Bob Borens likes so much. Average income in the blue countries is about $50,000. By the way, in Georgia, it's like five, fifteen, or $10,000. So they're bringing the average down. But $50,000, you go to the green, you have almost basically half that much. You go to the yellow, another half. And you go to the red, basically another half. It's like a half and a half and a half. So Anna Smith was right. You know, private property, freer trade, smaller governments, fewer regulations. It is very productive. My Marxist friends, and I still have Marxist friends, they don't carry Mao on pictures anymore, but um, <clears throat> will say, yeah, okay, capitalism is productive. The problem with capitalism, they'll say, is it, it's very unfair. The gains all go to the rich and not enough to the poor. So I've got data. This is, there are other ways to do this. You could do this with Gini coefficients, but no one knows what a Gini coefficient is outside of us. So uh, I do something a little bit different, but it's very correlated. It's the income share of the bottom 10%. So it's how much of all the income in the country, what does the bottom 10% have? Okay. Now, as you can see, it's not a lot. There's a lot of income inequality in the world. Uh, in the blue countries, a little over 2.5% of all the income goes to the bottom 10th of the population. But guess what? In the green, the yellow, and the reds, it's also about 2.5%. If you, if you do this as an XY, like a scattergram, it looks like a shotgun blast. It's just like a bunch of dots. The, the regression is like a flat line. There's, just, there's, just, there's no evidence, actually, cross-country evidence, that countries that are more economically free have more inequality. They just don't. There's inequality everywhere. And there's too much inequality for many people's tastes. But I got bad news. It's not really caused by the economic, whether you have economic freedom or not. You don't. It's not obvious to me that you're going to solve whatever inequality problem you think we have. It's not obvious we're going to solve that problem by taking your country from a blue country to a red country. That's what people say. We need to regulate. We need to raise taxes. We need to do all these things to get more equal, equality. But guess what? It doesn't seem to happen in the data. Yeah. It's not correlated to freedom of economics, but is it uh, correlated to something else? Other outliers? like? <clears throat> yeah. So uh, no. <laughs> the answer is no uh, on this. Nobody yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want, at the very end, if I have time, I'm, hopefully we'll, I've got, a, I've got something to say about the formal, more formal study. Because this is very low tech, right? If you're an econometric student, you are not impressed with bar charts. Neither am I. Okay? But these are the bar charts, just correlations, right? Uh, and, and, you know, poverty rates. Oh, look, poverty rates go down. That's good, right? You want poverty rates to be low, not high. So, uh, life expectancy. Look, blue countries, 80 years is the life expectancy from birth. Red countries, 60 years, 65 years now. Mort infant mortality, 5.3 in the blue, 50. This is all this is correlations, but you know I, I can do this all day, too. <laughs> I'm not going to, but I can do this all day. There's only one graph that I found that the economic free, like doing these simple graphs like this, there's only one variable I found where economic freedom is bad news. And Russ Roberts mentioned it last night. Obesity rates. <laughs> yeah, the only graph where the blue countries do worse than the red countries is if you look at obesity rates um, by, by, in pop, which we have. So it's the only one I found. But if you do infant mortality, access to clean water, you go, you go look at all of any variable, you're going to see that the blue countries on average do better. This is not, not proof, but it's, you know, it's something. How can you explain that mostly the, the the obese uh, people are, mostly they're poor, they're not so well. Yeah, so within the country they tend to be poorer. 
But uh, you know, you've got to realize in many countries, no one is obese because no one's getting enough calories. Uh, so it's economic freedom tends to bring more income. And when you get more income, certain percentages of the population, oftentimes the lower part of that population, but but yeah, it's, so this is another example that cross-country differences will be different than within-country differences. That, that's true of a lot of things, actually. Uh, I've got a happiness, I hate happiness indexes. I do an economic freedom index, and I think that's sketchy, like, and, and you know, borderline weird. Uh, there are happiness indexes, and they are exactly what they sound like. They literally just ask people on a survey. They don't usually say happy, but they'll say, how satisfied are you with your life? And then you put, them, put a number down. You know, I, I always think it's weird. I don't know how satisfied I am. Like, before lunch, I'm not satisfied. After lunch, I'm very satisfied. Uh, if I'm drinking a beer, I'm like 10 out of 10. I don't know what the numbers are. But anyway, I'm happy to report that was intended to pun there, uh, that pe people in blue countries are, are rich. So again, none of you are, if you're an econometric student, you're not impressed. Correlation is not causation. But it's not not causation either. I really, here's what people, everyone learned in, in junior high that correlation is not causation. And you know what most people use that phrase for? They use it to disregard something that they don't like. If you see some data you don't like, you just say, oh, cor correlation is not causation. I don't want to look at that. But you know what? It's not not causation. When two things are correlated, you should be asking your question. The next question is, oh, I got a correlation there. Is it causal? Because it may not be, right? But it might be, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the bar charts that I just showed are illustrative. They're just, hey, look at that, <laughs> right? Um, it's, no, it's no substitute for proper econometric analysis, but even a proper econometric analysis cannot prove causation. Nothing can prove causation. Causation is up to your your head, your judgment call. At the end of the day, there, no statistic is going to tell you if A causes B. At the end of the day, the only way you're going to decide if A causes B is if you decide A causes B. All the data that we have, all the regressions that we run, all the econometrics, all of that stuff, what I do for a living, is helping us decide whether A causes B. Okay? It's a judgment call. Okay? I can't tell you how to, but I, I can show you the correlations. It is. It is. It actually is. Yeah. yeah. It's up to, they're, they're, the numbers can't not make judgments. Numbers are numbers. No, you get proof only in math. That's right. You get That's right. Approval. We're not doing, uh, right, we're not doing pure math here. So um, I have got a, a, gosh, get the right, come on. I've got a chapter coming out in next year's report, um, which will be released in September, I think, um, where I read, <laughs> I read, 1,300 articles, 1,303 to be precise, articles. Since, two, since 1996 to 2022, technically April of 2022, there are 1,303 articles that cited the Economic Freedom of the World Index in a, in a journal article, a refereed, peer-reviewed journal article, in the Social Science Citations Index, which is the premier way of looking at citations. Okay, so by the way, that's pretty cool, I mean, for me. Uh, so, oh, thank you, thank you. Um, of the 1,303 journal articles, again, peer-reviewed journal articles in the top citations index, SSCI, 721 of those papers were empirical papers that means about 500 were just like, they cited us, but yeah, okay. I'll take every citation I get. But 721 of them were actually empirical papers where they were like ran a regression. They did a model. They generated some, some data and they used the numbers. Where there was some output that they put on the left-hand side, some dependent variable. Could have been GDP, GDP growth. It could have been infant mortality. It could have been hundreds of things. I've got a whole list of these, 720 papers. Uh, and then they put economic freedom as, a dependent, as an independent variable, as an explanatory variable on the right-hand side. And then they estimated whether, and then they controlled for other things. Everybody does, there's a thousand different ways to do this. You know econometrics, there's a thousand different ways to do this. 
okay? Uh, 721 papers. And then I coded them. By I, I mean I and two people I helped, who I paid to help me do this. We coded these. Was the result good? Like, for example, suppose you had infant mortality on the left-hand side as your dependent variable, and you had economic freedom on the right-hand side as an independent variable, and you found out that more economic freedom led to lower infant mortality. I coded that as a good thing because I think most of us think <laughs> infant mortality is bad, right? So lower would be, okay. So there are some cases where it wasn't clear what good or bad was. Like one of the papers was magazine subscriptions. Some marketing professor, like, like I don't, I guess magazines are good, I don't know. It's not like, not like infant mortality, but it's okay. So if, if the paper was basically claiming that economic freedom led to a good result, I coded it as good. <laughs> If the paper said economic freedom is leading to a bad result, I coded it bad, and then if it was mixed. Sometimes they run like 20 regressions and four of them were good, but 16 were like, like not statistically significant, or maybe they found a positive sign on one regression, a negative sign on the other, it was like mixed. I just coded that as a third category. So it's either good, bad, or mixed, or uncertain. Okay, those are the three categories. 720 papers, 21 papers. Of that, about half were mixed. No, good. Excuse me, green is good here. I, I, that's backwards. I meant that to be blue and that to be green. So green is good. So slightly over half of the papers, the, and I, again, I wasn't the author of the paper, just going with what they did, however they ran their regressions, whatever control variables they did, whether they did fancy econometrics or simple econometrics, whatever they did, if their primary results was economic freedom get, led to a good result like lower infant mortality or higher e economic growth or whatever the variable was, I coded it good. It's about half. A little bit, about 50%, about 45% was the mixed. Like, eh, you know, you don't get, an, like statistically insignificant or positive, negative, just kind of whatever, it's, didn't know. And 5%, one out of 20, 5% of the papers found a bad result, okay? All right, again, is this causation? No, this is still correlation. But now we're doing better correlation. We're not just doing bar charts. We're actually running regressions. We're controlling for things. We're doing the, we're, some of these are doing instrumental variables, if, if you know what that means. If you don't, that's fine. But it could be, you know, whatever. All right, um, this is very dense. But then I said, well, what about different categories? So, where's growth? Growth. Of the 721 papers, 92 of the papers were growth papers. It's the biggest, I think, biggest single category, growth. We, economists love our growth regressions. I've run a lot of them myself. Of the 92 papers doing growth regressions, 66% said economic freedom was good for growth. And yeah, now it's blue like it should have been before. Uh, and green, thir one third was, um, was mixed. And there's actually one paper, I think, it's 1.1, so it's one paper that had a bad result. And it was a piece of crap paper, but I wasn't judging the quality of the papers. Someone, they, these papers made it through publication. They got reviewed, it's not my job, not, I'm not a second reviewer. I would have rejected that paper, it was a terrible paper. But, so, one. So the growth gets a pretty good result. Immigration, only 10 papers. But basically, there's a lot of, there's, there's a few papers now saying, like, if you have more economic freedom, does that attract immigrants? The answer is yes. Okay, 90% of, of the studies found it's attractive. Only, and then one was, was negative. Where are, the, where are they gonna be the hard cases, the weird cases? Well, uh, what about inequality? Of, those, of that 5%, of the overall sample, 5% of the, one out of 20 found economic freedom was bad. Of that 5%, a lot of them were inequality papers, okay? Um, but if you also, but, but look at the inequality category. There's 50 papers now, 50 papers that had inequality as the dependent variable and economic freedom on the right-hand side as an independent variable. Surprisingly, 26% actually found more economic freedom led to less inequality. 
or more equality, however you want to phrase it. Slightly lower, 20%, one out of five, found economic freedom led to more inequality and a bunch of mixed ones. So 54% were just mixed. I, what I actually think the number is, I think the number is zero. I think there's no correlation between inequality and economic freedom. If you torture your numbers hard enough one way or the other, you might be able to publish a paper that says that you get, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's a big suspect but, of gender but, driven. Yeah. Gender. And, you know, scholars, you know, not, are people too. Uh, but this surprises me, though, that, that that's the, this is the, supposedly the Achilles heel of free markets is inequality. And right now, more papers have found economic freedom correlating with more equality. Now, we've got some that say more inequality, too, so, okay. Um, so this is a kind of a fun thing. Uh, what's another one worth talking about? Um, the only one, the other one, environmental is the other one. In terms of the red bars, the bad, the bad ones, environmental, human rights, environmental, human rights, and inequality are the only ones where you get, like, above 10% of the papers were bad. But in every case, you still see better results on the good side, so. I would think that low-skilled immigrants want a welfare state. Uh, I'm telling you right now that, that mo the immigrant flows tend to go from less economically free places to more economically free places. That's where, that's where it goes, you know, which means, in general, means lower welfare states. But, you know, it's not only a welfare state. It's also other stuff that's driving that, so, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, this is actually close to the end. The, the, we have a website. The, this is a silly URL. I hate it. It's just, but no one uses the URL. It's just Google, Economic Freedom of the World. Uh, and you'll go to the Fraser. It actually just redirects you to the Fraser Institute's website. And it looks like this. There's a nice map. You can get the data set. The Excel spreadsheet, which is like 20 megabytes. It's huge now. You can't even email it. Uh, there's also a state index for the United States and Canadian provinces and Mexican states. It's called the Economic Freedom of North America, if you, might, if you care. Uh, but uh, the, the website's called, it's at the Fraser Institute, though. It's their publisher. So. Yes, sir. I want to ask a question about that debate between uh, Smith and uh, Marx. Marx said that the, the, how do you say, like the big uh, monopoly or the big company yeah. control all the markets, media, yeah. government, and they have the connection to the, gov to the government. In Israel, it's happened a lot. I want to ask if did you measure in those uh, yeah. in those five topics how many companies that have in different market, uh, if they're too big, if there is right. enough monopoly in each of them, and if they took a control of you know all those markets. Well, so we we would have nothing in the index about monopolization. I would consider that to be like an outcome variable to to study. But of those 721 papers I I listed. I don't think a single one of those papers was like looking at some kind of measure of monopolization on the, on the left-hand side. Um, now, I take that, I mean, Ryan and I have a paper, it's like a note, it's like a four-page paper. Um, there is some, that we did something on that. Um, but it really wasn't an economic freedom paper. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. Market, no, no. You're right. I think that that'd be a great scholarly, because one of the main claims that Marx made was that that freer markets, capitalist markets, countries would have more monopolization. That's an empirical claim that's testable. And I'm, I'm thinking now off the top of my head that that was not a claim that anyone's bothered to test very well yet. So I invite you to write the paper. Um, uh, maybe I'll write the paper. There are, there is, the World Economic Forum does have a question. I don't use it in my index. But there is a question in that executive opinion survey about how competitive do you think the markets are in that country? And you could use that as your, your crude estimator for that. I mean, when you measure a free market, you need to count how many uh, companies or how many yeah. competitive we have in the market. Yeah, but the, the problem is what we, yeah, so this gets into the weeds very quickly, but the problem is we now know, uh, industrial organization economists now know there is extremely poor relationship between the number of countries and the degree of competitiveness. Uh, the number of, of companies is a very, very poor indicator. 
uh, so poor that like industrial organization people that study this like structure of markets like for their professions, I'm not an IO guy, but they, you cannot publish an article today using the number of co companies as an indicator of the, of the competitive situation in the market. Because we now know that you can have extremely competitive uh, situations with very few com companies. And you might actually have a, the flip side is you might actually have a large number of companies, but have that, have a somehow collusive control among them. So the number is really a weak indicator. And, and, and so it's a really complicated scholarly issue that IO economists really argue about which is maybe why no one's done <laughs> the study that I'm wishing they would do. Yeah. I had a question over here. Yeah. No. Uh, I want to add to him. Um, so do you consider, or maybe you will consider, to add something about the competitive of markets? Because if I have a government that is small as, and is unregulated, but the for example, in Korea, we have family firms that control yeah, yeah. all the markets uh, right. with the pyramids. So do you think maybe in the future to so I, that? I, I don't think I would put that in the index because the index is mostly policy variables. We're trying to, like, what are the policy regimes? And something like how competitive a market ends up being is like the outcome. And I think if I put it in the index, I would be kind of cooking my books you know, because the, the real question is, does economic freedom, do, do countries with more economic freedom, do they end up with more competitive or not markets? If I put that in the index, I'm, the answer is going to be obviously yes, because I've, I've made the index that way. So we want to make sure that we don't put those kinds of things in the index itself if we want to study that relationship after the fact. So just uh, there is like uh, uh, rules for uh, breaking out uh, cartels and monopolies. Yeah. Uh, so this is a regulation. This is something that yeah. we can put in. So um, we could put like competition policy laws or what Americans call antitrust laws in the index. But I can tell you right now there's disagreement amongst people that advocate economic freedom as to whether that sign should be positive or negative. And my view is, I'm not a big fan of antitrust laws myself. So um, the fact is, you know, there's no disagreement about sound judges <laughs> or tariffs among classical liberals who think about economic freedom. There actually is disagreement about whether we should have antitrust laws or competition laws or not, or whether they're good for economic freedom or not. So, you know, same thing with intellectual property. There's no IP number in here because there's actual disagreement about whether that's good or bad. For, for freedom. <laughs> so we're going to punt on that. Not, I don't want to cause, I don't want to argue with that about people on that. So it's, I, we're going to leave that separately. Um, you talked about there are 40 something uh, variables. Uh, are they all uh, equally weighted? weighted? Well, not, not at the end of the day. That number that's like for, for Hong Kong, that 8.9, that's the average of the five areas. So the answer there is yes, it's equally weighted of the five areas. But the individual components aren't equal, there aren't an equal number of them in each area. So, so in area one, there's five parts. And they weight one-fifth of area one. And area one is one-fifth of the overall index. So it's one-fifth of one-fifth. But in area two, there's nine components. So it's one-ninth weight inside of area two. And then area two gets one fifth weight because it's one of the five areas. So each component of the 42 does not have equal weight in the final index. They have equal weight inside of the area that they're in. And we don't, we don't pretend that, that we know exactly how to do an economic freedom index. You know, not, I, I don't say this just because I'm in Israel. I say this, this is my normal line. Moses didn't come down from the mountain with, like, the, to, with the actual proper weights for an economic freedom index. We, don't, we have to figure it out. And I don't know. There's no... So one of the things that we do, offer, that's why we offer the full spreadsheet, all the data to, to other people, scholars. And there are some people that have re-weighted the index or they've taken a variable out, right? That's fine. I mean, I, you know, some people, don't think, some people don't think area one should be in there at all. They think a two, that two, three, four, and five, that's all you need. So they'll, run, they'll, they'll take area one out. They, in other words, they'll give area one zero weight. Okay. So... Um, I, I'm willing to let other people make their own weights. We're just, we just do averages because it's easy. So. Yes, sir. Like in the book, Beyond How to Get to Denmark, how do you get countries that are dramatically, like 
<laughs> yeah, so yeah, so there's your question is, a, is the next logical question. Suppose you've now bought into my worldview. You now think economic freedom is good, or at least 50% of the time it's good, and only one time out of 20 is it bad. Okay? Suppose you now buy the, the theory. The next obvious question is, well, like, well, how do I get more economic freedom, right? And there is, um, let's see, it doesn't say here. Actually, I do know the number. Of the, of the 1,300 papers, 721 were empirical, there was about 90 papers now that had economic freedom on the left-hand side. They were trying to figure out why economic freedom is higher or lower, or why it's growing or declining in different countries. I did a review article you know, just last year, 2020, well, I guess it's two years ago now, um, with Ryan Murphy and Ben Powell, uh, where we reviewed, I think we didn't have 90, we had 76 papers, and we tried to figure out, and the short answer is, I got no idea. There, it's, we, we really, we, we see economic freedom is higher in some places, lower in other places. We see that some countries liberalize, they start low and they go up. Other countries like Venezuela start high and go down. We see this stuff, but finding explanations for that is not super easy. And I don't think there's a consensus in the literature. Um, a lot of things that were, have been tested though, things like common law countries versus uh, say French law, or statutory law type countries, Digitizing bureaucracy doesn't work. Yeah, I've never seen that study, but um, there's, it's, it's all over the map. Uh, some people think it's deep roots, like what was your country like in 1500? Is that still, uh, Mark would like that kind of thing, Frank. So I, there's a survey, I can give you the cit proper citation offline if you'd like it. Uh, we did a survey of that, it's, eh. I will say that one thing that does pop up probably is democracy. This is probably not a great surprise, but autocratic regimes are not, really friendly to economic freedom. Singapore is, Singapore is an exception, and Hong Kong is an exception. But the general rule, if you look at the countries that are blue down to the countries that are red, mostly it's democratic up on the top and autocratic down on the bottom. Not, it's not a perfect, you know, the R squared isn't one. But so the literature was pretty, pretty favorable towards democracy, democratic decision-making processes being better for economic freedom. I, and I think that's probably true. You know, I, but also, when I look at Chile, it was transformed, I think they were Yeah, there. so there are exceptions. And, and I think also, you know, you have to be careful when you go to the market side. Yeah. Because yes. the United States was a democratic republic. It was right. not a pure democracy. Right, so, so we make this point in our review that none of the papers that are looking at democracy are really looking at unrestricted democracy. Every, every concept of democracy in the literature is sort of a constitutional democracy with protection for, for you know, basic human rights and stuff. So it's complicated. But you know, for every Pinochet, for every dictator who gave, who gave their country economic freedom, there's 30 dictators who didn't, right? So uh, the reality is, if I was advising a country, I would never advise a country to get a dictator because the odds of getting uh, Lee Kuan Yew or Pinochet, who were both bastards, by the way, I don't, I, but they were probably less evil than other, but the odds of getting one of those guys is pretty low. <laughs> Most often you're gonna get a Mugabe, right? You're gonna get somebody really awful. So it's terrible, terrible advice. If you were trying to advise a country to get how to get economic freedom, telling them to get a dictator to do it is probably that's playing with fire. I think, are we out of, okay. The boss tells us we're done. So we'll, we'll I'm not going anywhere, so.